It's so nice to see you all here. Thank you for attending this event, this MLK Week event. My name is Allison Maurer. I'm a librarian at Marriott Library. We want to welcome you and thank you for attending today. We have a number of events going on on campus. Yesterday we had the rally and the march. It was really great over at East High, walking up to Kingsbury Hall. It was wonderful. Um, Today we have this event with Reverend Davis. The Resistance Revival Chorus is here. They're performing tonight. Uh, there's a screening of Till tomorrow. Uh, the keynote is Wednesday. And then there's an MLK Jubilee on Friday up at the Black Cultural Center. So a week's worth of wonderful events. Again, so wonderful to see you all and welcome. We have a number of things going on with today's event. It's going to be a conversation with Reverend Davis. We also have items from the collection. So we're really wanting to highlight what's in the collection at the library so people kind of know how to use it and do research and create new works, create new books, movies, films, documentaries, whatever the work might be. So Reverend Davis, as you probably know, donated his papers recently, just last October over 1,100 sermons, over 1,000 sermons. It's an amazing collection. So it's currently being processed and also being digitized. So we're hoping that can be become a really core cool research resource for the community to tell the story of Black people in Utah. We also started and launched the France Davis Utah Black Archive in October. It's a digital-based archive, and it's community-based, crowdsourced. So we want to really you know, get your content. We're very interested in your content so that we can build a great, powerful collection, strong collection, and have great stories that are told from those collections. So those, that's what's on display over here, some books from the collection, and then material from, from Reverend Davis's papers and other items in special collections. So Rachel Ernst will be over there if you want to talk to her about the collection. And then Donna Bellucci from Eccles Library will be over there, and I will be over there as well. So on to today's event. We are streaming it live. So hello to those watching online. It's, it's being streamed through Facebook. But really, it's about all of you here in the room today. We're so grateful that you're here with us. And we want to take questions from you. This really is a conversation with Reverend Davis. But I am joined with by Eddie Thompson. He works for L3 Communications, and he's also on the advisory board for the Human Rights Commission, the Utah Human Rights Commission. So this is a great partnership between the University of Utah and L3 Communications. Eddie is going to ask questions of Reverend Davis. We have them prepared, but of course we want to hear from you, and Reverend Davis wants to hear from you and to be able to have this conversation about the, this year's theme of choosing love over hate. Uh, so that's kind of our format. And then, you know, because we are streaming, we're also recording, if you'll just be conscientious of the microphone so that we can capture your question if you do choose to ask one, we, we can capture it with Facebook and then on the recording as well. So we have Heidi Brett here and Jordan Hansen who have some roving microphones. So just wait for them. And, and Eddie will kind of help facilitate that, that question and answering period with Reverend Davis. So on to our guest speaker, our keynote speaker, essentially our guest of honor. For today's event, we are very lucky to get to have a conversation about this year's theme, Choose Love Over Hate, with Reverend France Davis. Reverend France Davis once marched alongside Martin Luther King Jr. from Selma to Montgomery. Now retired, Reverend Davis served as a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Salt Lake City for more than 45 years. He has been pastor emeritus since December of 2019. He came to Salt Lake City in 1972 as a teaching fellow and graduate student at the University of Utah. He was appointed instructor in communication and ethnic studies courses, earning a distinguished teaching award among other honors. He retired in 2014 from the U as an adjunct associate professor emeritus. He holds numerous honorary doctorate degrees, including one from the U of U. 
He has written four books about Utah's Black history on display over here, including a memoir titled France Davis and American Story Told, published by the UV Press. Davis currently serves as the chaplain to the youth football team. In October of 2022, the Marriott Library established the France Davis Utah Black Archive in order to capture and preserve the stories of Black people in Utah. Eddie and Reverend Davis. Thank you. Uh, I wish my uh, wife and uh, children were here to uh, learn who I am. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you listen at that introduction and you have to uh, realize that you are somebody and that uh, your family ought to know uh, about who those people are. So I'll tell my wife when I get home. Uh, my son will be here uh, later on. Uh, he works, uh, he practices medicine at the uh, Huntsman Neuropsychiatric Hospital here on campus. And so uh, he may uh, be a little late in getting here, but he'll be, he's a friend of Eddie's. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, glad all of you are here. Uh, I want to make some opening uh, remarks and then turn uh, the time over to you and Eddie for whatever questions uh, you'd like to ask. Uh, I was born and reared during the days of separate but equal. Uh, those were times when the legally the law said that uh, African Americans and whites uh, didn't have to go to the, uh, didn't need to go to the same schools or the same uh, restaurants or the same uh, hotels or other places, as long as those places were equal. Now, of course, uh, they never uh, quite made it to equality uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so I grew up about a hundred miles from where Martin Luther King Jr. grew up and where we, and, and, but we didn't know each other. Uh, I then went to uh, uh, New Jersey for the summer and worked uh, for New Jersey in the summer, uh, 1963, delivering furniture. And on my way back home, got to Washington DC and there were all kinds of uh, vehicles, uh, outhouses, uh, trucks, cars, buses, uh, and people. And I asked my sister what was going on. And she said, don't you know that Dr. Martin Luther King and the marches on Washington are here uh, uh, and tomorrow will be the day. So uh, I hung around uh, a while and uh, didn't get to meet Dr. King, but was a part of the march on Washington. Uh, a year later, I was a student at Tuskegee, uh, which is a little college in Alabama, started by Booker T. Washington, popularized by George Washington Carver. And as a student there, met all of the significant named African Americans that were in the country. They came to Tuskegee for various reasons, including uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who came. Uh, Martin came and there was a march that uh, the students at Tuskegee had helped to begin in Selma, Alabama. And that march from Selma uh, would go all the way to Montgomery, Alabama. And I was one of those students, uh, unnamed uh, and unknown, uh, but one of those students who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, from Selma to uh, Montgomery. It was an exciting time. Dr. Martin Luther King was an exciting person. He could talk to anybody at any level, uh, no matter whether they had a PhD as he did or whether they had no D as my dad did, or, uh, and many other African-Americans had no D. Uh, they had no uh, uh, training, no formal education, but Martin Luther King could talk to them. And everything that Martin Luther King Jr. did, I believe 
he did it for other people, not for himself. He didn't ride the bus uh, for himself because his dad had a brand new uh, automobile, so he didn't need to ride the bus. He didn't stay in hotels uh, because that's where uh, uh, he needed to stay, but he stayed in them because he was trying to bring about full acceptance of all people in the United States of America and in the world. And I remind you, uh, as you gather here today, that Martin Luther King's work was not of just about work in the United States of America, but also about work uh, abroad and other places. And uh, the kind of segregation that existed in the South of the United States of America also existed here in Utah. In fact, if you were to go to the Century Theater, you'll see a big picture hanging on the wall that says colored entrance to the balcony. And uh, when uh, the most famous African-American musician came to Utah, uh, she was allowed finally to stay at the Hotel Utah, which is now the Joseph Smith building. But uh, she had to ride the service elevator and she had to eat her meals in the room. And although she was well known in other places and uh, well known as a singer and as a voice by the president of the United States of America, she's still here in Utah, was treated uh, differently. So I grew up in that sort of setting. Uh, those are my beginning experiences. I'd be glad to share with you details about anything that you would be interested in knowing about. Uh, I wanted to thank the library for their collection of materials. And those of you who are African-American in particular, if you have materials, papers, uh, the library would appreciate uh, getting those and storing those in your uh, in the library so that they would be available for uh, research. Uh, by the way, my son France has gotten here, and France, will you just raise your hand? <laughs> uh, he's uh, kind of shy, but. Uh, <laughs> That's that's France. <laughs> so I turn you now over to Eddie to uh, ask whatever questions you want to ask, and let's have a conversation between me and you and others that are uh, online as well. Eddie, yes. So thank you guys for being here today. We're so grateful for Pastor Emeritus France A. Davis to be here today to share with his experiences and different things. Uh, Dr. King once said everyone can be great because anyone can serve. And I think when you look at the body of work that Pastor Emeritus Francis Davis has put together, I mean, he's got a street named after him. Like, you must be doing something right. <laughs> so we're gonna kick it off. Uh, if you would just raise your hand, if you have a question, I'm gonna kick off with the first question here. Pastor, Pastor Davis, what process does one take to make a choice such as choosing love over hate? Uh, recently, uh, there were a number of us, including the Jewish community, who attended a conference uh, eradicating hatred in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When we attended that conference, we learned a lot about what already exists and how there are people that are still promoting hatred simply because they are different in one way or the other. Either they are different in terms of their skin color, different in terms of their education, different in terms of their political affiliation, different in terms of their economic development. And we learned ab about uh, how that is existing all over the country, all over the world, really. But to have a conversation that suggests that love is a much more powerful tool, as Dr. Martin Luther King suggested it was, a much more powerful tool 
for us to use is a great thing for all of us to commit to do. We are all in the boat together. And if my end of the boat is sinking, then uh, eventually your end of the boat is going to take on water and it's going to sink as well. And so we've got to have this conversation between all of us. I go to the legislature uh, regularly and they always, they know me when I walk in the door and uh, somebody is bound to identify me. There he is. <laughs> and they uh, then label me one way or the other. But uh, if you and I went together, if all of us joined our arms and our hands together and talked the same talk with the same conversation, we would likely get much more done. Thank you. Can you can you share a couple of experiences where you saw an example of choosing love over hate? Uh, I saw examples of choosing love over hate uh, by Dr. King himself. Uh, when in Selma, Alabama, uh, there were those who uh, would trample us with horses, uh, authority figures. Uh, they would uh, sick dogs on uh, us in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, use fire hoses. But Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the kind of person who believed that instead of fighting back, instead of giving even, instead of uh, vengeance coming from the persons to whom it was demonstrated that we ought to demonstrate love. And so one example is how he dealt with the authority figures, the authority figures who were always uh, trying to uh, do harm to him. Uh, there's a famous uh, photograph about Dr. King uh, being arrested by the policeman uh, and his arm is bent uh, behind his back. And uh, the story is that uh, he was arrested for driving the wrong speed in, uh, in the area which he was driving on. Anybody want to guess at, uh, at a 30 mile an hour uh, speed limit, what speed he was driving? Anybody want to guess? Uh, less than 30, less than 30. He was driving less than 30 miles an hour uh, and yet was arrested for driving too slow. Uh, most of us, uh, we uh, shake and we are uh, shaken by the red and blue lights that flash behind us when we are driving too fast, but seldom when we are driving too slow. Other questions? Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us today and for your service to Utah and the University of Utah. Um, uh, my name is Angie and I work kind of next door uh, at a research center here on campus. Um, I am, I was, um, attending the Tanner lecture with Heather McGee. Um, and when you just talked about the boat sinking, um, her metaphor is draining the pool and how um, coming together in communities has been um, a, a, a very important way for us to um, move the conversation forward and continue to work together towards that, which you also referenced. Um, given your um, uh, opportunities to live in many parts of the country. What do you see as particularly um, you know, challenging or unique issues here in the state of Utah in our community um, that, um, you know, that we might need to be tuning into harder, more specifically for our culture, our community, and, and the history that comes with that? Thank you for asking uh, that question. When I first came to Utah, uh, I've uh, had a very negative experience. I was denied housing. 
uh, and I think it was because of my skin color. I'm not sure, uh, nobody ever said, but I think it was because of my skin color. Uh, the uh, landlord took one look at me and said, not here. Uh, you're not going to stay in this place. Uh, and I asked why, and he said that the tenant that had been there a year before me had returned and that he was going to rent the place to that tenant. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Boya Jarvis, Dr. Dave J. Bush, who were both professors here on campus and I uh, took the landlord on and uh, before he, we were done with the landlord, the landlord offered me any one of his hundred <laughs> apartments that he owned uh, in the city. And of course, I turned them all down and stayed in, in <laughs> I stayed in International House, uh, which is here on campus for the first year that I was here. Uh, but, but fair housing was a real problem uh, back in those days. Uh, it's still in some real estate contracts, still today. There are restrictive covenants which say whether you can buy a house east of Foothill Boulevard or not, because you are a member of, quote, the servant class. The servant class. And that would be uh, people of Asian uh, background, people of Native American background, people of African American background, and people of Hispanic background. So there's still those kind of restrictive covenants that we still need to get removed. Uh, Representative Sandra Hollins last year uh, sponsored a resolution to get rid of slavery as a part of the Utah Code. And uh, we still got a lot of work to do. Uh, we still have economics that we need to work on. There are not many people who have reached the level that Thompson has reached at L3 Communications. And yet L3 made more money in one year than any other country, any other company in the state of Utah. Uh, but uh, there are not many people who have reached his level. There are not many people who have become uh, presidents. There's only been one black college president in the history of the state of Utah. And she was president of the college in uh, Price, Utah, uh, stayed a while. And then the, uh, the board of trustees decided uh, she had stayed too long. And, uh, and educationally had to uh, get rid of us. So education, economics, politics, uh, and then uh, social activities are areas that we need to work on. We need to say to African-Americans, you can put, go and participate in any social activity that is going on around the state of Utah uh, that that you want to go and can afford to go to participate in. So those are four of the things that I think we still need to work on. Thank you for that question. Uh, let's stay in that playground a little bit for a second. Um, you know, you, you talked about systemic reforms and things of that nature, challenges that we still face. Can you share a couple of the things that you've done throughout your career, um, helping shape a better Utah? and better companies and systems and things of that nature. In 1983, Congress passed a law declaring that the third Monday in January was a legal public holiday. But Utah was one of the seven states that said the federal law does not apply to us. And so we had to get a separate law and I was the chair of the committee. We got a separate law introduced in the state legislature. First year, it went down uh, resounding. Uh, it was defeated. The, the rest of the year, I spent time trying to educate our legislators mm. all across the state. And I traveled from Blanding to St. George to Salt Lake to Logan. 
are trying to educate the legislators that it was important that we have a Martin Luther King holiday. And finally, one of the legislators challenged me to a debate uh, on take two. Take two was a television show. Some of you, anybody remember it? Uh, uh, he challenged me to a debate. Uh, we debated the issue and at the end of the debate, he asked the moderator, what could he do to make sure that such a law as Martin Luther King's holiday uh, be passed in the state of Utah? And then he became the sponsor of the bill for the House of Representatives uh, in the state of Utah. He's still alive, he's still active. Uh, you, uh, if I were to tell you his name, uh, you hear his name regularly. Uh, whenever there's a challenge to any activities that are done by the authorities of the state of Utah. So, th so that, that's one of the things that uh, we've gotten done. We've gotten a Martin Luther King holiday. We got a street name for Martin Luther King. And on that streak is Trinity African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is the oldest black organization in the state of Utah certainly the oldest church uh, in Calvary Baptist would be the second oldest, but Trinity would be the oldest. Uh, also, the Mignon Richmond Park is on that street. Uh, Mignon Richmond was the first African American to graduate from college in the state of Utah from Logan and never was able to get a job in the area in which she graduated not because she wasn't qualified, but because of her skin color. Uh, and by the way, uh, her niece just died two days ago, and uh, we're gonna have a funeral service for the niece of Mignon Richmond. So I think the, uh, some of the things that we have done, uh, we had gotten done, has been the, uh, related to Martin Luther King, uh, the street being named, the park being named Mignon Richmond uh, and many other uh, things that we can think of. I wanna open it up to any other questions. Does anybody have any questions for Pastor Emeritus Davis? There we go. Good morning, Reverend Davis. Good morning, Emma. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, we have been participating in MLK activities uh, throughout the week and, and these coming days as well. And as we were at the MLK march yesterday at East High School, one of the teenagers said to their parents, why we got to keep telling people to love one another? Shouldn't they just automatically do that? So, Reverend Davis, from your experience and talking about love and building this community, this beloved community, why we got to keep talking about this, <laughs> Pastor? Why, why we? It's, na it's, na it's, <laughs> it's natural for us to hate one another. It's a natural sort of feeling to decide that what we hear about people that are different than us is worthy of hatred. So it's natural to hate. So in order to counter hatred, we've got to do everything within our power by telling people, by showing people, by doing it ourselves to love one another, regardless of our differences. Uh, you are aware that uh, my toilet flushes the same way as yours. <laughs> you, you do know that my stove turns on with the same kind of knobs as your stove, uh, that the bed I sleep in is similar to the bed. I mean, we have uh, so much in common. And yet, because of the natural uh, sense that we have to hate each other, uh, we have to keep telling people to, to love one another. Well said. Uh, Pastor Davis, Pastor Emeritus Davis, you, you've been you know, in Georgia, 
in divided Georgia, segregated Georgia. You come to Utah, you've experienced different things in Utah. Uh, discrimination, I recall a story about BYU, for example. How have you stayed grounded personally? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I have been in, I have lived in all of the states except four. Wow. Except four states in my short uh, lifespan. All the states except four. And I believe that the way African Americans are treated and responded to here in Utah is much worse than any other place that I've been. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my wife and I made the decision to stay here so that we could bring about some changes, some legal changes, change the laws and get fair housing available to everybody, uh, change the economic makeup. Uh, there were four African-American school teachers here uh, when I came. Uh, now there are more than 50. <clears throat> uh, and, and there was a uh, black superintendent of schools until recently. Uh, but uh, so we've, we've made uh, lots of changes and we need to make uh, more of those. Uh, politically, we still have so few African Americans that are elected to political office. One in the state legislature, uh, Sandra Hollins. I mean, uh, why, why just one? Uh, many of us go by the percentages and we say one would be equal to the 2% of the state's population. And maybe so, but uh, maybe uh, that's a place that we ought to go beyond the percentages of the state's population. Uh, in terms of getting representation. Any other questions from the audience? <clears throat> Hi, Reverend Davis. Hi. My name's Carson. I work here at the library in the human resources department. Thank you. Um, just going based off what you said earlier about how hate is so natural um, and maybe love is a little bit more hard work and you've done a lot of hard work in your life, especially meeting so much hatred with love. Um, what keeps you going? What, how do you pull upon so much love in your life when you're met with so much hatred and hard work? Uh, my parents were lovers. Uh, they not only loved each other, but they taught their nine children to love rather than hate. And so we learned early on uh, to uh, put up with, to deal with, to uh, get along with people who are of different uh, backgrounds than us. And we learned that in such a way, uh, we learned it spiritually. We learned spiritually that vengeance belongs to God and that it doesn't belong to any of us. And so uh, we practice love as opposed to hatred, as opposed to the natural sort of reaction. Uh, we practice that. Is that somebody else? Yep, there we go. Uh, cool. By the way, while uh, the mic is coming to her, uh, Pastor Moses just came in. Stand up, Pastor Moses. He's the new pastor at the Calvary Baptist Church uh, where I served for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little bit of time. Um, I, I mean, I had a question about um, the people in this room are often the people who are either um, I like to call champions or they want to be allies and things like that. Uh, which is great, you know, we can always all get more educated, learn more, challenge ourselves, etc. How do we, are any suggestions that you have to reach the people who, you know, I tend to say politely are more the naysayers uh, that, that really aren't really uh, wanting to be in the boat or, or fueling hate or things like that? How, how would you say, what would well, be a suggestion to reach them? 
First, first of all, I want to clearly say that I agree with you, that the people in this room are people who would normally be expected to and would likely respond positively. Uh, Mark Matheson is over here and Betty is over there. And there are a number of others whose names I could call that are, uh, would, would be natural in terms of showing love. So how do you deal with the others who are not? Well, first of all, you gotta, you gotta find them. Uh, uh, and they are not always obviously a, uh, obvious, obviously uh, a present. Uh, sometimes they hide behind, well, they hide. Uh, and, uh, and so you gotta find them first. And then secondly, uh, you have to make the special effort. And I, I'm tired just from thinking about all of the stuff that I was asked to do here on this campus, for example. I'm, I'm tired just thinking about that. Uh, it makes my back hurt worse than <laughs> picking cotton. <clears throat> uh, but I'm, I'm tired of that. But still, although tired, you still have to continue to go out and find people as I did with the state legislators. I went and knocked on their doors. I went to their businesses. I met them. I called them uh, Mr. and all sorts of uh, good things uh, so that I could get in the door and then I could share with them what I needed to share. So first of all, you got to find them. Secondly, uh, you have to go where they are. You have to go where people are in order to help them to change to what they need to change. Dr. Bell. Morning, Re <clears throat> Morning Reverend Davis. Um, Morning, Reverend Dr. Bell. Um, you've, uh, you've been a, a professor here on campus, um, and so what can the University of Utah do um, to get more love here on campus? There's there's a lot of there are a lot of in, um, incidents that happen that we don't know about, um, but they're happening all the time in the classrooms and or just on, uh, in the environment. Uh, what can the University of Utah do to one increase the number of uh, underrepresented uh, students. Um, and um, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences in the classroom um, while you were uh, teaching here? Uh, what does the university, what can the university do? What does the university need to do? Uh, one of the things is we need to go beyond the athletic arena in our recruiting. Uh, we do uh, much of our recruiting for this university, at least, of African Americans because they are good ball players or they are graduate students. But we don't do much to recruit the local people who live here in town, who graduated from West and East and uh, other high schools that are African Americans. So I think one of the things to do is to uh, go beyond the athletic arena in terms of recruiting. Uh, when I came to this university, uh, there were less than 200 African Americans. Anybody know how many there are on campus now? I'm, I'm sorry, Eddie. Around 500? Or, yes, around 500, a little more than. Okay, around 500. Uh, but total number of students would be what, 35,000? Hmm. 35,000 students, and yet only 500 of them would be uh, African American 
heritage and background. So uh, I think that that's another area is to uh, recruit uh, them in areas other than athletics and uh, graduate students. Uh, I was recruited as a graduate student and many of you came here as graduate students, but uh, how many of you grew up in this community, African-American, and went to school here and learned about that? Secondly, uh, I think that the university, uh, the present president has a uh, new policy that is more interested in finding people of different backgrounds and bringing them to the university. And I think that that policy needs to be passed on to the deans and the uh, professors and uh, more of the people that are on the, on the lower levels. Uh, now, uh, let me turn to some of my experiences. Uh, when I came here, one of the very first experiences that I had as in the classroom was from a fellow professor who said that I have to make sure that these students pass. <laughs> and what he was saying to me was that it, uh, I had an obligation to uh, let uh, African American students pass because they were good athletes. And I said to him, uh, clearly, uh, if he doesn't not do the work in my classroom, then uh, and doesn't come to class, then, uh, well, anyway. Uh, uh, so, so, I, so I think we have to stop just passing people because they are, of a particular hue or a particular athletic background or so forth uh, at the university. I wanna piggyback on, that's a great question that you asked Dr. Bell. Um, Pastor Davis was my first black teacher in the state of Utah. Uh, I, I grew up here and uh, went to Leighton High, but it wasn't until college where I had my first black teacher. And I'll never forget it because he, taught black history and black studies. And it's a situation where one of his assignments was for the class to go to a black uh, church. And for me, it was like, oh, you know, I always go to a black church. It's not a big deal, you know, not a big thing. But what happened was we got into that, his church, we went to Calvary Baptist Church. And what happened was is other students never saw that experience. And so now they're starting to ask questions and they're starting to learn and see something different that, um, that they perhaps never have. And so there's a method to what he's trying to do and accomplish. So we just, we thank you, Pastor Davis. And, and, and one of the uh, comments that was regularly heard by me uh, was that uh, our churches are not reverent because they're noisy and loud and clap their <laughs> hands and pat their feet and all of those sorts of things, and that they are not reverent, and that they uh, are not, uh, uh, well, let's just, let's just deal with that. Uh, but, uh, but I suggest to them that reverence is a different uh, thing for different people, that what's reverent for one person, quietness and sitting down with your hands folded and uh, never saying amen or right on or <laughs> any of those sort of phrases is uh, not necessarily an indication of irreverence, but rather a response to the God that we serve. So I insisted that my students go to an African-American church while they were students here on campus. And I, I'd probably get in trouble today with Supreme Court the way it is if I did that today, but uh, <laughs> during those days I did. A question right here. How much more time do we have for questions? 
at another 15 minutes. Do I have one? Okay. Hello, my name is Eric Dukunda, and I am a third year student double majoring in political science and gender studies. I have a question of how one stays motivated when they feel unheard, because I know my brother, he's an eighth grade student. He came home and he's like, my teacher said the N word teaching history. And I told her, you can't say that. And when he went to go talk to the school, they're like, oh, for educational purposes, it's okay, but you guys can't say the N word. And my brother's like, well, no, it's derogatory. You can't say that. So how does one feel like stay motivated when they're un feel like they're unheard? Well, let me let me just say uh, loudly and clearly that I believe that there is no place when the N word is appropriately used, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's textbooks. Whether it's... But I believe that uh, you ought not that you ought to find another way to say what it is that you have to say. Uh, now, how does the student stay motivated? First of all, you have to know who you are. Uh, my, uh, the, the guy that hired me when I first came got fired at the end of the second year I was here because he couldn't make tenure. And I stayed until 2014 from 19. 70 until 2014. Well, that's a few more years <laughs> than he had stayed. Uh, but uh, his notion was that uh, uh, somehow I was in the position that I was in because of my skin color, but I was not there because of skin color. I was there because I knew the subject matter and I could handle whatever was being thrown at, at me. And so I think that's the other thing is you have to know who you are yourself and you have to uh, be able to say it. I think once you say it to your professors, uh, that's inappropriate to use that kind of language or that kind of book. I think you uh, then move on and do your thing to show that the word, the N word is not an appropriate word to use. Great question. We got one more in the back. Hello, Irvin Davis, it's good to see you. Hi, James. Um, you mentioned that you came here and stayed because you wanted to make some changes. Um, you know, there's other organizations here that are trying to make some changes. There's universities and companies that are trying to recruit diversity. But from the other spectrum, what can we share or say to students of color or professionals of color why they should stay in Utah? Good, great question. Uh, uh, when I first came to Utah, it seemed to me, and I don't know that this was true, but it seemed to me that all of the African Americans that were graduating from the university we're leaving on the first train that came by or the first plane or the first boat or whatever, but they were leaving almost immediately. And so I think that unless we can find ways of engaging people in every aspect of the community, we will not be able to keep them here. Uh, there are people who are qualified and yet there are people who say to me, well, I can't find any blacks who can do this, who can do that. Well, you haven't looked. <laughs> uh, evidently, if you can't find any, uh, because there are some people that are around who are able to do everything that you can do. And so I think the, the Chamber of Commerce, <clears throat> the Black Chamber of Commerce and other organizations have to be able to uh, facilitate an opportunity for full participation in the community at every, uh, for everybody. Uh, and I think the last thing is, uh, maybe not the last, but at least the last that I wanna mention, is that we also have to pay people for the work that they do. Hmm. Uh, the labor of black people is not any less valuable than the labor is 
of any other person who does the same kind of work. So we have to pay people a livable wage so that they can then be able to survive as well as their peers. Mark, you were gonna say something. Well, I just wanna thank you so much for being here with us, Pastor Davis. And you mentioned that your uh, time at the university has not always been without challenges. And uh, I just want you to know that, you know, when we brought Congressman Lewis here uh, in 2015 and you and your community at Calvary and in the broader uh, Wasatch Front community, uh, that was an extraordinary time. And uh, it's great to hear about your teaching in the classroom for which you won awards. Eddie, if I may, thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, I, and I, I'm just very grateful to you for what you've done for the University of Utah. And I wanna thank Emmy Houston, who is currently working uh, as a colleague of ours here at the University of Utah. And you, you undoubtedly know, Reverend Davis, that, that Emma recently won the uh, Human Rights Day Award from Salt Lake City, the Human Rights Commission and the Mayor's Office in Salt Lake City. Emma, I'm just so grateful that you received that recognition and grateful for what you do for this institution every single day. So in, in addition to my heartfelt thanks, uh, I just wanted to ask you about, you know, what was the last stage, I guess, in Dr. King's work, which was the Poor People's Campaign. And uh, we know that Reverend William Barber uh, is uh, carrying on with his colleagues in trying to bring people of all races together who are impoverished uh, to work for change politically and, and economically. And it strikes me as so fundamentally important if we're gonna keep the boat afloat. And I just wanted to get your uh, responses to Dr. King's idea, uh, Reverend Barber's uh, continuation of, uh, of, of his work and, and the work of others in, in that particular project. Well, I'm, I'm convinced that as long as the larger community saw Dr. Martin Luther King's work as African-American work on behalf of black people, they were okay with it. But once he stepped beyond that and started talking about the Vietnam War, started talking about poor people, started talking about people in general, then uh, the, those were the last days of his major work. But I think that's such a critical work that all of us have to do it and do it together. We have to put our shoulders against the wheels and push in order to make sure that everybody is treated the same way in the, our community, get the same benefits as everybody else does. We're other running, questions? Running short on time, so any other questions? Um, so we've been talking a lot about like bringing and recruiting people here. Um, so my question kind of goes with that. I had a really good friend who she got it. She was recruited by a company here in Utah and she was black and um, every all of her friends said, why in the world are you coming to Utah? <laughs> Do you know how they treat us? And she's like, it cannot be that bad. That's literally what she told all her friends. It cannot be that bad. She came here, she lasted six months. Mm. She was treated so badly and it made me cry. I, I witnessed it, I tried to help as much as I could. And I was like, you know, we can try to move. She lived in a different county than here in Salt Lake. And uh, I was like, let's find you an apartment in Salt Lake. <laughs> um, and we really tried everything that we possibly could, but she was just treated so badly. That she literally quit with just her savings, packed up and moved back to Texas hmm. because she was treated so horribly. And now she has that bad taste in her mouth. And so even when she has to travel here for business, she doesn't want to come. And that's the kind of perception. So when we are recruiting, when we are trying to get actively to get more diversity here in Utah, how do we change that perception of Utah? Because it's already out there. So how can we change that perception of you know, our community and our state um to be able to retrain people because some people don't know like she thought it was going to be a great experience and it ended up not being so 
how to how to change that perception uh, is uh, much more than I know how to do. Uh, I've been trying to change the perception since 1970, and uh, I still get uh, when I go to New York, when I go to Washington D.C., when I go to Florida, I still get people ask me, "You live where?" <laughs> And they, uh, they want to know, uh, am I part of the dominant religious group? And there are all sorts of questions that they ask. Uh, so how to change that, I don't know how to do that. But I think that one part of it is for people like myself and Emma Houston and, uh, and uh, Dr. Moses and Franz Davis II and Eddie, Thompson and James Jackson and others to stay here and to then go out and say uh, Utah is not necessarily a bad place. You can make it uh, what you want it to be. Uh, I mean, Dr. Bell back there was, I, I believe you were born here, right? Dr. Bell was born here. Uh, in the area. And so he's been able to make this community his community by living here and staying. And I think that that's, that's, that's the only hope that I can give. Uh, when the hierarchy says this is what we're going to do and this is the way we're going to treat people who are different than us, then the lower people need also to understand that and to learn how to do that as well. Uh, some years ago, my uh, daughter was uh, on her way from school in our community and was told by the neighbors that she couldn't walk on a certain side of the street. Well, there's something wrong with that. Uh, that uh, any other child could walk on either side of the street, but for my daughter to be told that she couldn't walk on a certain side of the street. So. I think you make a good point there. Um, for some, several of us that have grown up here, that are raised here, some that even come to the state on different accords for, you know, for the college and things of that nature, it's, it feels like we try to make it a mission, kind of like what you said to make Utah great, to make this community, this beloved community, a better place. And I think, you know, one of the things, one of the themes from yesterday was we need each other. We need each other to stand up. We need each other to be advocates. We need each other to be allies. We need to speak up in the face of racism. When we see things wrong, we got to speak up. We got to say something. We got to support. I think you had a question. How, how important it is to teach our children and all the educational institutions about human rights and accountability. I didn't understand the first part of it. Of course, you said how important it is to teach human rights to, okay, to our children, to our children. It's, uh, it's essential that we teach human rights to all people, uh, that all people because they are human. Dr. King said it this way, that uh, uh, hatred in one place is hatred in every place. And so it's important that we teach people that they respect, appreciate, and celebrate with others their differences. Those differences are like the smorgasbord restaurant. Uh, you you go to the small you go to Chuckarama and you don't eat everything that Chuckarama has. <laughs> but it's an option. You you pick certain things in Chuckarama <laughs> and you eat those, and because of that, other people are then able to pick certain other things and to uh, use those. So I think uh, it's important that we teach human rights that we teach people to love and appreciate one another, and that all of us become a part of the beloved community. All of us become a part of the beloved community. And that's whether we are black, whether we're brown, 
whether we're red or whether we're white, we still have to become a part of the community. Thank you all for listening. Um, I believe there's uh, Thank you so much, Reverend Davis and Hetty Thompson for being here today and Allison for moderating. Um, so we planned box lunches for 50 people. So um, we, we do have those on your way out. Feel free to take a box lunch. Um, first come, first serve, if you will. And um, I'd like to ask our Marriott staff to abstain and, and let our guests get lunch um, first. So. Um, once again, another round of applause for these two things. And also, please stick around, check out books and items from France Davis Papers, and explore the collection. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember, we still have a lot to get done. <laughs>